And welcome to everybody who's joining us online. I understand our numbers are um, over a thousand now, so thanks very much for everybody's participation. So I now have a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker and also a moderator today, and I'm very excited about this, Rochelle Jackson. Rochelle Jackson, I've known her for about 13 years, as I said earlier. Um, I met her from my McDonald's days, and she's always been such a huge inspiration to me through her podcasts, through her stories, through the amazing trips that if anybody happens to be following her on Facebook, it's always exciting to sort of see the journeys that she's on. She's been a social compliance auditor since 1997. Um, she's conducted over 2,000 social compliance assessments in 80 countries across a range of industries. And I think it's absolutely phenomenal. And as I said earlier, I strongly encourage you to look everybody's full bios up um, because I'm, I'm not gonna take away from her time. But during Rochelle's career, she's conducted dozens of human rights impact assessments on behalf of investors, multinationals, and multilateral institutions um, seeking to carry out due diligence. And I was thinking the other day, I think, didn't you do one of the original assessments or, or um, chain of custody assessments on bison? Was that, was that you? It wasn't you on bison, okay. I was thinking it was you on bison because we had dinner at a restaurant that served bison the other day, which reminded me. Um, but your field work has contained a, um, a number of assessments on child labor um, in the cobalt mining community in the Democratic Republic of Con Congo, and also various styles and uh, studies on child labor, forced labor, and land rights in the sugar supply chain um, in dozens of different countries. So in addition, Rochelle has worked with Fortune 500 companies and industry initiatives on such issues as CSR policy and development, code of conduct implementation, monitoring protocols and, and human rights, including trafficking and slavery. And Rochelle recently launched a, a podcast series, and she has some absolutely fantastic podcast series on child labor and forced labor, and certainly encourage, you know, even auditors, if you want to get... Um, fresh information from a certified auditor, please pop on to Rochelle's podcast. It's called Human Rights with Rochelle, right? Human Rights with Rochelle. And strongly encourage you to pop on and listen to this. And, and she really, you know, she brings some current information on as well as her wealth of knowledge and experience. Um, so I would now like to hand over to Rochelle Jackson. Oh, sorry. As I hand over to Rochelle, we've got a brief video to play. Video. Okay. <laughs> there's, a, there's a video after me. <laughs> well, thank you, Rana, for the very kind introduction. It is Business and Human Rights with Rochelle, is the podcast. I'm really delayed posting some new episodes that I have, but there's a great one with Avidus if you want to listen to that on the marking the anniversary of the Rana Plaza building collapse. Well, it's an honor to be here today, and um, my apologies in advance that you're hearing so much from me today and tomorrow. Um, I think Rana wanted me to provide this keynote because I did begin as a social auditor, like she said, in 1997, so that was almost 27 years ago. It's been quite a journey from that moment to this moment. And uh, today I find myself speaking with all of you from the annual meeting of a credible, professional social auditor organization that didn't exist a decade ago. Um, so that is an incredible mark of progress for an industry that I grew up in. When I first started out, it wasn't even called social auditing. We were labor investigators, a role that had been born out of a US Department of Labor effort to bring apparel brands and manufacturers to the table to enforce compliance in local apparel sweatshops. This was called the No Sweat Initiative and started in 1994, around the same time that Thai migrant workers were found handcuffed to sewing machines in my hometown of Los Angeles in a shocking case of forced labor on US soil. Under the No Sweat Initiative, if clothing labels were found by the government inside any shops with wage and hour violations, the brands were required to sign a contract with the U.S. Department of Labor stating they would monitor the labor practices at their sites on a quarterly basis and issue briefing reports to the government on those findings. 
I was trained by a former U.S. Department of Labor field investigator. That was my auditor training when I began this work. All of our protocols for site visits and reporting were developed based on U.S. Department of Labor investigation techniques. We even used surveillance to validate work hour records, stopping by in the evenings or on weekends before the visit to walk inside the shop, count the number of people working, and mark the backs of the time cards because there were no electronic systems in use. We would mark them with a pen on the back so we could see later if they were the same records that we were provided for review during the audit or if we had been given fake records. The shops were usually quite small, about 15 to 30 employees, and our visits were two to three hours. The goals were unlike the goals that exist today. We were there to validate the accuracy of the records through interviews and document review and surveillance, and then determine if we needed to calculate back wages based on wage noncompliance. Over time, this audit framework began to expand. Companies that had relied on these local sweatshop hubs were offshoring more and more of their production into large factories overseas. NGOs began to investigate what those labor conditions were like, and brands faced exposés into conditions they had not been aware of at all. Uh, you may recall when child labor was founded a Kathy Lee clothing supplier in Honduras. That moment brought this issue to national attention in the US and led to the establishment of the White House Apparel Industry Partnership under President Clinton with a focus on using standards and third-party monitoring to improve supplier practices. Brands at that time turned to these no-sweat quarterly monitoring teams and asked for help in other countries. Our U.S. team began to fly all over the world to assess labor practices, eventually building up local teams to do this work. The scope of work and what we did changed in critical ways over time. And the focus of these remarks that I'm sharing are really on this idea of the evolution of auditing and tying it to the future that lies ahead of us. So I want to walk through in a little more detail this path to how we got from that moment to where we are today. Very quickly, brands decided they didn't want a labor inspection or policing approach with their suppliers. They wanted a partnership approach. And our name was changed to social auditor from labor investigator or labor inspector to make it more neutral. The scope of work expanded from wage an hour to encompass child labor, forced labor, workplace safety, everything that Levi Strauss had built into their first supplier code of conduct, the first ever, drafted in 1991. For me, this was a very exciting time to be a social auditor. Everything was outside the box because the box didn't exist yet. Still operating from our Department of Labor framework, the focus of our work was to follow the line of query for any visit. Wherever our time was needed to identify the most egregious risks, we could freely allocate that time to do so without concern about data not collected, a fixed number of interviews not completed, or a chemical storehouse not visited. I recall arriving to an unannounced audit of a factory in Guatemala. Nearly all the visits at that time were unannounced, and so it would take a little while to get approval to go in and begin the work. While my colleague and I sat in the front office waiting to be allowed in, I picked up the local newspaper and began to read through it. It had a photo of the factory that we were in, and the article uh, gave us information about a government investigation into claims of physical abuse against a pregnant employee who had been <clears throat> slapped at work. We knew immediately what we needed to do, and we already knew that we could do it without requiring any prior authorization to deviate from a standard audit plan. Because at that time, the audit firms largely provided the structure and methodology for the audits, including the reporting and data gathering templates. My colleague and I modified our audit plan on the spot to focus on a high volume of brief targeted worker interviews to gather specific data from the largest number of workers possible on the environment and interactions at the site. Similarly, when a US labor rights group sued nearly 20 US retailers for their role in exploiting Chinese migrants in the US Pacific Island territory of Saipan, I went with the team to investigate the egregious allegations of forced abortions among those workers. When the factory didn't let us in, we knew what additional investigative options were within our purview. We waited for hours outside the factory until the workers began to leave. 
which didn't happen until 10 o'clock that night. When we finally saw them exiting, our Chinese-speaking auditors fell into the crowd of workers walking home to their dorms and began to speak with them, finding a group of workers willing to be interviewed privately in the dormitories. This sort of flexibility and adaptability was what I was most used to. When I participated in the first ILO social auditor training in 2009, I was confused by their discussion of checklist auditing. What was that? But by that time, there was a profusion of different audit approaches and many entities carrying out auditing of different kinds. There were companies like Gap with nearly 100 internal audit staff carrying out their own monitoring work. There were NGOs like Rugmark working on child labor free certifications for a specific sector. There was shared monitoring taking place through industry associations, similar to what we see from Amphori today. And companies utilizing any combination of these approaches to audit their suppliers. And many factors were driving this, of course, especially the increased demand for auditing as more and more industries began to seek information about labor and human rights in their global supply chains. By the time the 2000s arrived, NGOs were expanding their focus to the toy sector, the electronics industry, and the extractive sector, eventually including conflict minerals. So we began to see all of these groups of companies enter the space for the first time and um, try to learn from what apparel had been doing and bring in their own needs to an industry that was rapidly evolving. Not only that, over time, brands, manufacturers, and retailers that were requesting these audits developed a more sophisticated sense of what they needed from the data. They also developed their own audit protocols and audit tools, some of which work better in the field than others. They had, understandably, a need for greater consistency from audit to audit. Freedom to follow the line of query, as I had been trained to do, was traded for more consistent data and reporting from the audit. There was a de desire to ensure that any audit visit would reasonably identify the majority of issues and scope of the audit, creating a push for an enormous amount of activity to be carried out in the prescribed time frame of the audit. Scope creep was a common refrain among auditors, struggling to contain the scope of work to related issues as companies explored opportunities to add on environmental data collection, CTPAT security data collection, even worker well-being data collection onto the social audit time frame. But this concept of data collection was an important transition in the evolution of the social audit. While initially audits had focused on identification of high-risk practices that presented immediate reputational risks for brands, with time this evolved into consistent measured data identification of the most common challenges for suppliers. And this allowed a, a focus on to providing information and insight into supplier practices, um, determining how to support the areas where they were most challenged, and focusing on how to spend resources for capacity building in these areas, as well as corporate reporting and goal setting. Companies were beginning to make commitments akin to those of the UN Global Compact launched in the year 2000, to report on their progress to align to commitments of labor and human rights, the environment, and anti-corruption. Reporting on the volume of audits done, the types of findings that had been identified, any improvements that had been made, this became a key goal of many brands and retailers in this space. So the audit reports needed to provide this consistent flow of data. Even as the use case for social audits was changing, there was, and is still today, concern from critics that audits were being used by companies as a stamp of approval for suppliers and supplier practices. If a company could indicate that they had a social audit program in place, did that absolve companies from responsibility to engage on challenging issues in the global supply chain? I mean, they're auditing. Is there anything else that they need to do? The audit that's going to sort everything out automatically. Or was the audit the tool for engagement? Or was there still more for companies to do? Looking back for a moment to my work in the late 90s, we worked with a large big box retailer, not Walmart. They were among the first retailers to launch a global monitoring program. They adopted a three strikes policy for their suppliers, focusing on the grade of the audit. A medium or high risk grade was a strike, and they had two additional chances to reach a passing grade before purchase orders would be canceled. 
This is how we understood the program operated. It seemed like a strong incentive for suppliers to make any necessary changes to comply and ensure a low risk standing. And to some extent, we saw that happen. I saw factories in Sri Lanka build new exterior fire escapes. Factories in the Dominican Republic eliminate the practice of year-end contract terminations. And many sites throughout Latin America end the practice of pregnancy testing at the time of hire. There appeared to be palpable progress. I could see it happening as I returned to sites over time. However, at one point, I paid a visit to the head office of this big box retailer. In a meeting with the attorney in charge of managing the compliance program, that might be a clue to where I'm heading with this, the attorney in charge of managing the compliance program, I learned that the decisions to suspend work orders sat with the purchasing team located within another division of the company, and he had no leverage or influence to enforce the policy. The three strikes policy existed on paper, but it wasn't able to be implemented. Their ability to engage with and impact their suppliers was extremely limited, not because of the audits themselves, but because of the way compliance was structured within the company. I learned from that experience how important it is to understand how audits are being used. The audit scope, the audit protocols, the audit team, those are all important. But at the end of the day, the auditor submits the data to their client, and the client determines whether or not that audit becomes an effective tool for change by how they decide to use it. And the way it's used differs for every company. There are some companies that don't even allow auditors to make assessment decisions when carrying out an audit. And I mean determining what, what is a conformity and what's a non-conformity. Their role is to collect data only and send it back to the brand who then determines how to proceed with their supplier. That said, the end user of the audit is not the only one who can benefit from the audit data itself. The audit firms can be beneficiaries of audit data collection and analysis. Almost 20 years ago, long before APSCA, I worked in an audit firm heading up the research and development team. We had an internal database for managing our audit scheduling. I worked with my team to create a system to track audit outcomes across all our different clients. In every country, no matter the audit format, template, or protocol that had been used. We used this audit data to identify common trends in audits by sector, by country, and even to identify whether our audit teams were routinely identifying the most common issues in the region. Our trainers had access to the data to determine whether local auditors were missing any critical issues that were expected to exist in a sector or country, and then work with them to ensure their skills were at the needed level. After a number of years of this data collection, we got permission to gift our data to an academic team at Harvard University to allow them to analyze all the information we had compiled. It required many hours from our team to orient the academic researchers providing information on our social audit process, the data entry decisions we made and the context for the data we had provided to them. They were able, and actually still are doing this, to publish a number of studies from this data about audits and auditors. Because our audit data was linked to our scheduling system, they were able to see, for example, information about the auditors who had conducted the audits, such as their tenure, their level of training, their educational background, their gender. They were able to identify correlations between the gender of the audit team and the number of findings identified, showing that mixed gender or all-female teams typically identified more findings per site. Although our firm already saw mixed gender teams as best practice, this confirmed an additional business case for team-based audits and able to creating a business strategy to be more intentional about scheduling the audit work. For the first time possibly ever, academics could become a partner in understanding the social audit process and the implications of how audits were being carried out with an eye to publishing objective information to help improve the process. And so we've seen how the audit that began as a reputational risk identification tool became a supplier compliance tool, which it still is, but also became a data collection mechanism. And more than that, as we consider the evolution of the audit, I think it's important to reiterate that in every case, the audit is one tool in the toolkit of a company's assessment of their supply chain risks and practices. And that's a core concept for understanding the future of social auditing. Over the next two days, we'll spend time diving into panels that examine 
What is next? What is coming with human rights due diligence and emerging legislation around the world? Hopefully we'll begin to examine and answer questions such as what these, development mean, these developments mean for the future of social auditing. I suggest that we will see companies continue to use auditing as a primary form of supply chain data collection, as well as monitoring of improvements in labor practices over time. But companies may also be pushed to consider whether there are additional tools they should or could be using to have the greatest impact on eliminating adverse risks to human rights in their supply chains. The UN Guiding Principles introduced the idea of a smart mix. The commentary to UN Guiding Principle 3 suggests that states, or governments, should consider a smart mix of measures, national and international, mandatory and voluntary, to foster business respect for human rights. In this context, however, it's companies that should utilize a smart mix or an enhanced toolkit of measures to carry out due diligence and related activities to mitigate impacts following the UN, global com or UN guiding principles. In other words, we will continue to see companies being pushed to consider how they should expand their available toolkit to have an effective impact on human rights in their supply chains. While a global auditing program may offer a blanket approach or a universal approach to a supply chain, in the future there may be more focus on strategic approaches that vary at the regional level, depending on risk. Companies that have not yet begun to carry out human rights impact assessments at the country, sector, or commodity level may find they're channeling more resources to that sort of activity that will provide more nuanced data and allow tailored regional responses to human rights risk as opposed to a universal global approach. As companies come into the scope of le legislative requirements to implement due diligence in their supply chains, the fall-on effect is for their supply chain partners to align to those new requirements. Rather than waiting to be audited or respond to compliance questionnaires, some of these supply chain entities will certainly seek out certifications that they can provide to all of their clients to demonstrate they meet a specific standard. We may see a growth in that seeking out of certifications, especially at the raw material level, where the end buyer, whether it's an apparel brand using cotton or a tech company using cobalt, has way less leverage and influence upstream. Those upstream suppliers will be motivated to de decrease uh, duplicative requests for data or audit visits by obtaining certifications that are seen as meeting the requirements for human rights due diligence. And I certainly look forward to the panels of the next two days to hear and learn from others about their thoughts on these future-leaning trends. As I conclude this examination of the history and future of social auditing from my own personal perspective, I have to caveat that it's not a linear path. Nothing in life is really linear. We come back to things in loops and leaps. So while I see the evolution of audit process, I also see a bifurcation where there is at times a need and re relevance to return to the audit framework that focuses on investigation and allows for the line of query to be followed. I'm thinking specifically of the last year in the United States and the growing awareness of child labor in the manufacturing sector. Important exposés have shown how children are working on night shifts in dangerous conditions that are prohibited by law for children interfering with their schooling in violation of all international standards of protection for children. A number of companies have responded by deploying targeted audits of third-party contractors, including cleaning companies, where the most egregious cases of child labor were identified by the US Department of Labor over a year ago. These audits tailor the methodology to the issue at hand, using surveillance, audit activity during night shifts, in-depth focus on hiring and recruitment processes, and review of contractors. In this case, the checkboxes are again removed. It won't be a SMETA four-pillar audit or an RBA VAP that provides the most relevant data on this issue. A specific process defined to address the core concerns of child labor may be the most effective approach in this scenario. And that doesn't mean that SMETA and RBA are not effective as social audit tools. It means there's a smart mix option available, and at times like this, it's important for companies to be flexible and deploy the best tool for the specific situation. Similarly, yesterday, Impact delivered a training to help auditors be aware of how to focus on forced labor concerns. Tomorrow, we'll hear more about the role audits can play for companies conducting due, due diligence to comply with the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. 
There are times that a targeted social audit specifically crafted to confront critical supply chain issues are part of the smart mix response, including when companies are responding to a forced labor uh, related customs uh, withhold and release order in Malaysia, for example. In closing, I think it's more important than ever that we have ABSCA to set a bar for qualified social auditors, to encourage the ongoing learning and educational development of auditors, to ensure that there's a group of professionals available to engage on social issues and supply chains in this time of change and opportunity. And I look forward to hearing from all of you over the next two days. Thank you for being part of this dialogue and helping to make a new vision for our future.